All right, thank you, Nick. Uh, so good evening and welcome to Disability Awareness Day, Housing for All. Uh, my name is Adam Wexler and I am tonight's facilitator. My pronouns are he, him, and my visual description is I am a white man with blonde hair and glasses wearing a red shirt. I'm here tonight as a housing committee chair of the Vermont Statewide Independent Living Council or Vermont Silk. The Vermont Silk is an autonomous organization that represents the disability community in the state of Vermont. The Silk promotes the principles of the independent living movement, advocates for all Vermonters with a disability from a systems level. On the housing committee, we work to address housing issues facing the independent living community. As a person with a physical disability myself, I've personally experienced, experienced some of the issues people with disabilities face with finding suitable housing. When I went to the University of Vermont, I lived on campus with the assistance of personal care attendants who were mainly other students. Once I graduated, however, I had few options but to return home uh, in Jericho with my parents. Since that time, I have considered moving out, but there's only one assisted living facility in my county for people under 65 and I've been intimidated to explore accessible Section 8 housing options. The COVID-19 pandemic has deepened these concern, concerns, not to mention the current dearth of uh, personal care attendance. From my perspective, we as the disability community in Vermont must advocate for more housing opportunities, especially options that are accessible, affordable, and safe. With that said, I would now like to turn the program over to Sarah Launderville, President of the Vermont Coalition for Disability Rights and the Executive Director of the Vermont Center for Independent Living. Hey everybody, um, thank you so much, Adam. And um, I'm Sarah Launderville, my pronouns are she and her. I'm a white woman with medium length brown hair. I'm wearing glasses. I'm in front of a red curtain and have a blue and white um, shirt on tonight. The Vermont Coalition for Disability Rights is a membership organization and we're made up of organizations working to advance the human and civil rights of people with disabilities and to ensure full and equal participation in all aspects of community life and the political process. I want to thank all of our member organizations for putting this together tonight. Also to our Vermont um, Coalition for Disability Rights Coordinator, Karen Lafayette, and the Vermont Developmental Disabilities Council for your partnership and funding, which helps pay for our disability awareness workshop series this year. And also a very, very special thank you to our event coordinator, Nick Moreland, who you met at the top, um, who has done all the behind the scenes work to ensure that we have a great program tonight. Before we dive specifically into the topic of housing, I'd like to take a moment because one of our longtime leaders of independent living and of the Vermont Coalition for Disability Rights, Deborah Lisi Baker, died unexpectedly on March 18th. Deborah had a hand in anything related to advancing the efforts of disability justice here in Vermont. She was an active member of the VCDR steering committee and helped start the organization. She worked alongside many of our member organizations and worked tirelessly on disability related policy. She was a beautiful human and as our community mourns her, I try hard to capture what her spirit brought to us. The concrete changes in our system and state policy that went from housing, healthcare, employment, to recreation and the arts. She taught us and others that disability truly connects with all aspects of life and therefore our work connects to all aspects of our community. She mentored so many and saw the importance of teaching and guiding young people with disabilities. She is missed daily. Her love and dedication lives on in our work and the spirit of independent living. So please join me in a moment of silence honoring the tremendous legacy of Deborah Lisi Baker. Thank you. So housing is one of the biggest topics people with disabilities find themselves in conversations about and we find ourselves in conversations about there's so many layers of a need regarding housing and disability and the connection to different disabilities um, and the connection to what access means. Back on the 10th anniversary of the Americans with Disabilities Act, Deborah Lisi Baker testified in front of Congress 
and she shared one of her favorite quotes that quote, the universe is not made up of atoms, it's made up of stories. Tonight, we hope to have some of the voices of individuals experiencing barriers in housing and hope our hopes about the housing connecting with individuals in Vermont working in housing and disability with a strong hope that people will come together and make specific changes that will benefit our community. Recently, there was an editorial published, and many of you have seen it and contacted us about it in Vermont Digger, by a local real estate developer on the topic of affordable housing. He cited accessibility requirements as a reason for housing not being affordable. So in keeping up with my, my theme of bringing Deborah tonight, Deborah decided it was important to respond to that editorial. And I'm going to quote portions of the editorial response she had. Quote, what we choose to do about access in old buildings matters. The health department tells us that about 20% of Vermont adults have some form of disability and that about 11% have serious trouble walking or climbing stairs. Both lived experience and demographics tell us that we need to address the present and future needs of seniors, working age Vermonters, and households with children who need mobility or other accommodations in their homes in the place where they work and learn and where services they require. All this work is invaluable and requires a shared understanding of and commitment to accessibility and adaptability and to the current and projected future need for accessible housing for adult households and families with children. In the early 1980s, she listened to Annie, who was um, a staff member at the Vermont Center for Independent Living, report on her day, which included crawling up a few flights of stairs to visit a peer who was stuck at a top floor apartment in a building without an elevator. It was what was available for what the peer could afford. And she concluded um, her response with, Vermont's access rules were written to respond to inequities like this. Vermonters still share these stories today, 40 years later. We will never meet the need of accessible and affordable housing and public spaces if builders, realtors, property managers, and policymakers continue to ignore or underestimate accessibility needs until they find themselves looking for accessibility for themselves or someone they love. So the, world, the word accessibility means so many things to our community, um, and really it all comes down to inclusion. So that those of us with disabilities have options where we live and where we, where we are employed and how we live. I wanna thank so much our panelists again, who will share their stories regarding housing access, affordability and inclusion and about the barriers they are currently facing in housing. Thank you all for being here today to help identify and work on solutions to ensure inclusion of people with disabilities in housing. Thanks, Adam. Thank you, Sarah. As we were planning this evening's event, we were very mindful that accessible, affordable, and integrative housing is an exceedingly large issue for the disabled community. We work to invite individuals who have stories and experiences that can briefly highlight some of the housing issues people with disabilities face daily. This is not meant to be all inclusive. We want to acknowledge that from the beginning. This presentation is a glimpse into some of the issues, but ultimately it's important uh, for our community to continue to interact and tell our stories. We're hoping that the presenters tonight will help connect the dots to how sharing our experiences can help impact policy decisions. We have many presenters tonight, so we ask that you please hold your questions and comments until the question and answer period at the end of the program. Thank you. Tonight, we'll be hearing from parents, uh, Deborah Lambden and Sandy Julius, Vermont residents, Janice Hall and Brooke, Derek Malbro, uh, Randy Lazat, peer advocate with Northwest Counseling Support Services, Val Hughes, VCIL, uh, Deaf Independence Program Coordinator, David Barnaby, an electrician from West Hartford, Connecticut, Representative Tom Stevens, who's Vice Chair of the House Committee on General Housing and Military Affairs, Josh Hanford, uh, Commissioner of the Department of Housing and Community Development, Monica White, Commissioner of Department of Disabilities, Aging and Independent Living, Rachel Selig, uh, Director of the Disability Law Project, 
David Martins, uh, Executive Director of the Vermont Affordable Housing Coalition. Megan Roche, uh, Community Development Underwriter for the Vermont Housing Finance Agency. And Patricia Tedesco, Program Services Manager at VCIL. We're going to begin our conversation tonight with a few people with disabilities, as well as parents with adult children with disabilities who have various varying experiences related to housing. First, I'd like to introduce Janice Hall, uh, who dreams of a time when people with chemical sensitivities will have access to safe housing, healthcare, and social services. Thank you. Um, I am Janice. I'm a white woman of average build and height, and I have short brown hair, and I'm wearing glasses and a green shirt. Um, I am hoping to be able to share some slides with you. Um, Nick, do you have the slides available? Hi, Janice, this is Nick. Uh, because we were having some difficulties, technical difficulties today, could you go ahead without them? Is it possible for me to share them on my own screen? Sure, go ahead. And I wasn't really set up to do that, so it's going to take me just slightly longer to uh, I had it timed pretty quickly to my five minutes, but let me share my screen if hopefully that's enabled. The host needs to enable screen yep. sharing. Um, Janice, I think I can actually do it. Hold on just one second. Okay. Thank you everybody for your patience. And I'll just say while they're trying to work on that, um, rather than telling my own story, I'm in safe housing now. Um, so I, I wanted to share with you um, some information that uh, is not so much my story, but a compilation of a bunch of people's stories because I um, started a support group in Southern Vermont for people who have chemical sensitivities. So over a quarter of people have adverse reactions to chemical vapors. And um, for more and more people, it's reaching the level of disability and they struggle to find homes that won't make them sicker. Next slide, please. So this slide lists some of the conditions and symptoms and some of the products that can cause trouble. The um, things like asthma, allergies, multiple chemical sensitivities, mast cell disorders, migraines and others and products that come into play with housing include adhesives, air fresheners, carpeting, foam products, pesticides, paints, plastic appliances, scented laundry products, volatile cleaning and sanitizing supplies, and vinyl flooring. The thing I really wanted to point out to you here is that safer products are available. They would have no fragrance chemicals, no VOCs, volatile organic components, and no sensitizing ingredients or contaminants. So although safer products are available, it's a bit of a challenge because of how many different people would need to understand the problem in order to make housing safe. Next slide, please. Uh, oh, we're not at that point yet, but okay. so. If you can back up to the last slide, uh, I want to point out that the um, the next slide that is the people who build or remodel housing, the people who paint or do insulation, the people who clean or maintain, the people who prepare a unit for selling or renting, all of them can bring in things that make the air and the surfaces intolerable for someone with sensitivities. So if a real estate agent brings in Glade plugins, the place is ruined for most of us. If we ask the property manager to not repaint the walls, but they do, it's ruined for most of us. So um, I want to share with you, next slide. Instead of my story, I'm gonna share with you a housing needs survey that was done in 2019 by Health Risk Navigation and of the survey respondents, 45% of them were from the USA and 42% of them were from Canada 
and then the rest were from a collection of other countries. So in this first slide, it shows the question, does your current home meet your health requirement needs? And 27% of people said no, 54% said only partially. Next slide, please. This slide shows that 10% of respondents were homeless at the time of the survey. Interestingly, 45% of them who said they were homeless said they could actually afford to buy a home if they could find one that was safe for them. Next slide. Now, when asked what type of housing they would rent, the most common answer by far was a house. Second place was apartment. Shared living situations got very low numbers. And, you know, that's probably because apartment dwelling is often difficult when fragrances from common hallways and neighboring units can't be kept out. Next slide, please. So this slide shows the number of bedrooms needed. The most common choice was two bedroom. Second choice was three bedroom. Many of these people have children or they need an extra room because they need to air out newly pur purchased items. Next slide. When asked if they would benefit, um, no, sorry, this one shows uh, how far the person would move to take advantage of safe housing. 41% would move within the state, 35% would move elsewhere in their country, and 22% would actually move to another country if they could find safe housing. Next slide. Oh, we seem to have lost slides, but there's one more, which is um, if, uh, don't worry about it, I'll just explain it. If uh, um, when asked if they would benefit from a low toxi toxicity village, 84% of the respondents said yes. And I'm guessing in most cases, this is probably because fragrances from neighbors' laundry vents have become a real problem as new chemicals are invented and added to those products. So there was more to the survey. Um, I think we should be posting a link in the chat. And if Nick doesn't have that, I'll post it after I finish speaking. What I wanna to say to wrap up is this is a complex problem with many inputs. However, we should not let that keep us from working on partial solutions as soon as possible. Individuals have been asking for accommodations. We need some muscle to back us up. I'm not sure what this will look like, but just toss out one example. I'm thinking of public housing agencies and housing trusts. Do they get funding from the state? Could the state have grants with terms that require these organizations to make progress on this issue? Just brainstorming here. I'd love to meet with people, be a resource. Anybody can contact me at freethecanaries at gmail.com. I will put that in the chat. And that concludes my comments. Thank you so much. Thank you, Janice. Uh, we now have a short video uh, courtesy of the Vermont Developmental Disabilities Council on service supported living options. Thanks, everybody. This is Nick. I will be showing that in just one second. Kirsten Murphy, Executive Director for the Vermont Developmental Disabilities Council. 
Many Vermont self-advocates and family members are talking about how they would like to see more service-supported living options in developmental services. I recently spoke with a young woman named Nicole Villamere about her living situation. How about you tell me a little bit about what your housing situation has been like in the last few years? Well, I had to leave my uh, home provider suddenly and I didn't get a choice in the matter. It was really frustrating and then I tried to live in another home I got too stressed out and too frustrated and I did something that I regretted. Yeah, that's okay. That happens. What happened after that? They told me my only option was to live on my own in my own apartment. Oh, what do you think about that? It's okay. It's been really lonely and like ever since COVID began, I don't get to talk to people I go to POC, Prevention of Crisis. Is that the same person every time? Nope. They have to piece a lot of things together and it's very difficult because there's not enough people to cover shifts on the weekends. Yeah, I remember you telling me something about how you were promised that if you lived in your own apartment, you would get wraparound services. That's what they said, but then they never did that. They say like they don't have enough staff to like help support me. So that sounds frustrating. How do you like living on your own and doing your own cooking and shopping and that kind of thing? How does that go for you? I don't really do my own cooking because I'm so stressed or tired or I tend to just snack a lot. It's hard for me to do house cleaning. I got to learn to do my dishes and do all that, but they are going to be hiring someone to help come in to clean the bathroom. Oh, good. If you could live in your ideal housing situation, what would that be like? If I had my choice for housing, I would try to like live with some older friends. Yeah. More like of a home provider situation. But it's just like they're not giving me a lot of choices. Actually, by the rules, they're supposed to have some choices. Anything else you want to tell us about housing? I don't want it to just powered staff. They don't really know me. It needs to be more homey. Well, that is a wrap, I think, Nicole. That's the kind of story we need to hear what real people in real time are facing around housing. All right, thank Good. you, Kirsten. Nice to talk with you. Thank you, you so too. much for doing that. Advocate, change, join. Our next speakers are parents, Deborah Lambden and Sandy Julius, uh, who will share their stories about housing challenges for their adult children with disabilities. Deborah, do you want to go first or do you want me to start up? Um. I'm fine going first. <laughs> Go ahead. Okay. First of all, thank you. And um, I know Nicole Villamere. She is an absolutely lovely young woman. I've known her for probably 20 years now. So anyway, just vouching for Nicole. My name is Debbie Lambden. I identify as she, her. Um, I am a woman. I have blonde hair and I'm wearing a rose colored shirt. Our son Ari was born at 24 weeks, weighing one and a half pounds. He has cerebral palsy, developmental disabilities, walks with a walker, and is deaf. He is social, outgoing, funny, and engaging. Ari is 33 and has been in shared living since he was 24, coming home to us every other weekend. He is presently in his fourth shared living situation in 10 years. After Ari graduated from Austin School for the Deaf, he came home to live with us for two years as my husband and I tried navigating the barren landscape of supported living. Howard Center was unable to find staff to serve his deaf communication needs, and he had no deaf peers with whom to relate. However, the designated agency in St. Albans, NCSS, was offering a new program for deaf adults with DD. Coincidentally, I met a single mother with two children 
who was looking for a stay at home job and jumped at my offer to be Ari's SLP. In many ways, it was wonderful for Ari. The children were interactive with him and his involvement in the deaf program created a community of signing peers. Although Ari seemed well adjusted and happy, after four years, his SLP informed me that she, quote, hated being a shared living provider and that no one would do this job if they didn't desperately need the money. What ensued for us was a nerve wracking trial and error recruiting campaign, SLP. We finally purchased a townhouse hoping to attract potential SLPs and to ensure the comfort and safety of our son. When Ari's case manager and her husband, both deaf and with a baby, presented themselves to us for consideration, we were thrilled. With no explanation to him of what was happening, his retiring SLP brought Ari to his new, new home and essentially fled the scene never to see him again. It quickly became clear that his new SLPs regarded Ari as nothing more than a necessary evil to be endured in exchange for their wonderful new home. The mother avoided any room that Ari was in. Ari was ignored and misunderstood. We were aware of his unhappiness. On the occasion of their son's birthday party, they asked us to take Ari home so that their relatives wouldn't have to see him. The father told us that their relatives didn't like disabled people. We expressed disappointment and asked for them to have him stay. They agreed to let him stay, but instead, without telling us, they had him go to a deaf respite person's house. When it came time for him to return, Ari laid in a corner crying. The respite person got in touch with us and said she didn't have the heart to return him. We told her not to. In a frantic two days, we had Ari's SLP changed to the respite person. He had lived with a deaf family for less than three months. His new SLP seemed ideal. She lived with her deaf partner and deaf daughter, two dogs and a rabbit. All seemed good for the first year, with Ari enjoying an extended deaf community through this active family. Money was tight, and his SLP took on an additional client. The client's higher needs caused a lot of arguing and tension between his SLP and her partner. Finally, her partner moved out, leaving the SLP with her daughter, two high needs clients, two big dogs, and a rabbit. The house became dirty and unkempt. His SLP was nearly always angry and frequently sick. Ari began biting himself out of frustration. We met regularly with an NCSS psychologist and psychiatrist. Nothing ever came of those meetings. After two years on her own with the two clients, his SLBP decided to give up the other client. The dysfunction continued. She remained angry and sad. Her rabbit was attacked and killed. She submitted her notice in August, terminating her shared living arrangement with Ari as of November 1st. Ari's wrist became deeply scarred with bite marks. On November 1st, when we went to get his things, the entire house had dog hair and rabbit droppings all over the floor, including Ari's bedroom. Since the rabbit was killed in August, that meant that his SLP hadn't vacuumed for at least three months. Ari's case manager was supposedly doing home visits every month. It was impossible not to notice how appallingly filthy the house was. We had to keep reminding NCSS to advertise for a new SLP. All attempts amounted to nothing. Ari was placed in a remote respite house for three months. Ari spent days alone with one staff. Many icy winter days, the driveway wasn't plowed. All the food was canned or frozen. This three month period was extremely isolating. Finally, one person applied for the shared living position. Since then, Ari has been happily living with a nice family with two children and lots of pets, although very little sign language is used.
My husband and I are now in our 70s and have health issues. We still have Ari home with us twice a month. And although he is sweet and fun, he is also extremely physically and mentally demanding, making it harder for us with each passing the year. We stay at wake, awake at night worrying about what will happen when we no, are lo, no longer around. What we are striving for is a forever home for Ari with friends and peers who can communicate, love, and appreciate him, where he can thrive in a safe, inclusive, and enriching environment. Thank you for hearing my story. Wow, that is a tough one to follow, uh, but the final couple of lines in that are exactly what my daughter Kate, who is up on the screen right now, wants too. She wants a forever home. Um, my name is Sandy Julius. I am a white woman with um, a really bad um, dye job on the bottom of my hair. And then I'm going gray on the top due to COVID and I'm afraid to like go back to the hairdresser still. So um, yeah, this is Kate Julius. She's my daughter. Um, she's showing off her really fancy $55,000 wheelchair on one of those pictures. Um, Kate has hydrocephalus, uh, cerebral palsy, epilepsy. It is an, a, a, remarka a remarkable thing how many of our kids have epilepsy which does require sort of that 27, you know, 24 seven um, eyes on them. So um, as I've gotten to know about all of this, I'm, I'm kind of struck by, you know, how many of them have epilepsy. Um, you know, I know Deb's story, I've known, you know, we've been in this community for 22 years now, Kate is 22 and, um, you know, about four years ago, I knew, Deb's story. I knew a bunch of other stories. I knew that shared living providers um, and the model that was currently the only one available in Vermont was not what I wanted. Um, I started doing research. Uh, I, you know, I did research on Heartbeat. I did research on the Yellow House. I have a, a very unusual, almost three acre property in South Burlington. And I thought, well, this could be a great congregant housing place for a bunch of my friends. You know, Adam, your, you know, your mom and I have talked about that. I mean, it doesn't, there are lots of people that could live in this house and be really happy. And I'll just go live in a little tiny house on one or the other. It's a triple lot. So I could just build a little tiny house. And then I realized that uh, there was no one to call. And I'm not as, um, I'm, I, I think of myself as a really industrious person, but I'm not as uh, smart as, as Deb was to buy a condo or, or a house or, you know, heartbeat mom or yellow house mom to, you know, raise money. That is, you know, I was working. I'm a single mom. Uh, you know, I just didn't know who to call. I did meet with Howard. They were, you know, I've talked about it for three years or four years, um, you know, and as we got this grant that we're all excited about and it's sort of what we've all organized around, um, you know, all this money coming in around housing and trying to make sure that our families get a piece of this money, it became more urgent. So it's urgent to me. I'm, I had a birthday yesterday. I turned 59. I transfer Kate. You can look at her. She's 65 pounds. She outweighs me by five. I pick her up. Medicaid and Medicare just denied her track system. So I have to go to battle for that. Um, but in the meantime, I'm picking her up every day, toileting her, washing her, doing all that stuff. She's wants a forever home. She wants to sing. She wants to like be with people that want to like play we with her and like listen to YouTube endlessly and listen to Christmas carols. And I can promise you that is not me in another couple of years. Like I can't do it much longer. And, you know, my free labor, um, you know, is going to run out and I want the best for my daughter. Um, she deserves it. 
And the other thing I wanted to mention was, you know, this discussion about housing and development, you know, I really encourage people to stop talking about it in terms of accessible housing. You know, it is not accessible housing. It is a universal design for everyone. It's easier for everyone. It's not just for our old people. It's not just for our, you know, friends that are, you know, have physical disabilities. It's for everyone. It's easier for me in my home right now to get my groceries out of the car. It's easier for me. Um, so, you know, just sort of changing that mindset, especially since we're talking about housing and, you know, development, you know, universal design is beautiful and helpful for everyone, not just my amazing Miss Kate there on that screen. So I really appreciate the time you've given me and I really thank you all and uh, thank you for letting me talk. Thank you, Debbie and Sandy. Uh, next, we'll hear from Brooke. Uh, who will be sharing their story by phone tonight. Just one moment, this is Nick, while I uh, pin Brooke. Brooke, if you're by phone, feel free to go ahead. Hi, <laughs> um, I didn't prepare for this very well. My name is Brooke. Um, I'm actually a caretaker, in-home caretaker for my significant other. Um, I am 5'5", five five. I have brown hair with pink on the end. Um, I am a woman. Um, so a couple years ago, three years ago, April 2nd, 2019, my significant other uh, was shot, became paralyzed, saving my life. Um, at the time we were residing in a hotel that was uh, set up more as like a rental unit. So um, like an efficiency apartment basically. And uh, when he returned, he, you know, he was paralyzed and the hotel was not set up adequately. Um, our bathroom was not accessible to him. Uh, so, so services like OT and PP struggled to be able to come in and work with him. They would not work with him in the hotel. Um, which put all of that on me. I had to sponge bathe him um, and do his PC and home. Um, the, the owner or landlord of the hotel completely refused to do any remodeling or allow us to have any remodeling done, even though they were in the process of doing so, they wouldn't work on ours. Um, we had an incident where he was trying to get inside. The doorways were too small. Um, and he actually fell out of his wheelchair and cracked his head on the pavement there, um, which resulted in a hospital visit. Um, so we struggled a lot there. It took about two years almost into his injury before we found an apartment. Um, I could not get state funded or subsidized housing. Uh, the restrictions were too, um, the, the restrictions were really strict. <laughs> We couldn't have a bad landlord reference. We couldn't have any past electric bills unpaid or any past uh, internet bills unpaid. We kept getting denied in all of the state funded housing that was suitable for him where they had disabled apartments um, or handicapped accessible apartments. They had it based on his low income on being so on social security and me not making much being his caretaker. Um, couldn't get in any of us. So we found, you know, I found just a regular apartment through a regular landlord. We thought it was going to be great. His wheelchair was, you know, it's still a little iffy on fitting through the doorways, but it, I could wheel him in and out. He could get through on his own. It did not have a ramp. Um, we actually had a disability rights attorney from BCIL who donated her ramp to us and installed it. Um, but the landlords have denied that they gave us consent to do so. They wouldn't let us put a ramp out in the back steps, which we did get, they did tell us when we were looking at the place that we could do all of this, but when it came down to actually moving in and doing it, they wouldn't. Um, we weren't able to get a stair lift by the time they gave us consent to get a stair lift, uh, which would allow him access to the upstairs where our kids' bedrooms were. Um, and where the bathroom was, we get, were uh, given an eviction instead. Um, the landlords became very discriminatory. They started discriminating with our neighbors, um, attacking us in every aspect that they could. 
good. We have struggled to uh, fight this eviction. They're giving us a no cause eviction um, because they can get away with that. Um, there's nothing else that they can evict us for. You know, we've got our rent paid and we're fairly good uh, tenants. So we've been fighting with that. Um, I'm still sponge bathing Brandon. Brandon, my significant other, is around a little over 300 pounds and he is a very big guy and I'm not very big. Um, you know, he has nursing coming, but nursing only comes. I want to say once for him. Everything else falls on me. I do bowel program for him. Um, I dress him. I transport him. I manage all of his appointments. I do that on top of all of the kids. Um, but one of the biggest things that I've seen for a struggle in housing and just in general with people with disabilities is discrimination is really big. And they try to get away with saying they're not discriminating by giving you things like a no cause discrimination or, you know, denying it. Um, and that's been a really big struggle and it's not even a struggle for him just physically they put their cage out things in the driveway to make it so his mobility is more difficult and he can't get around um all of those things are tough but the toughest part i'm noticing for him is the emotional damage that it's causing him he has a lot of emotional health issues because of his injury and when people get away with calling him things like wheels or other very discriminatory names and attack his family, you know, putting him in situations where they're yelling at him, not giving him access, all of these things are emotionally damaging. And that is almost sometimes worse than the physical. Um, so I would like to see that there be more housing opportunities for people that are disabled. We have state funded programs for disabled people to have proper housing, but getting access to those is near impossible. You have to be a perfect person, perfect tenant in order to get into them. And um, that's been a really big struggle for us. There's no reason that anybody with a disability should be going through some of the things that I've heard alone, but the fact that he can't walk and everybody else around him can, and he's forced to sit in a room he chooses to sit in a room, but he also has, you know, feels like he needs to just sit in his room all the time and not get out and access everything that everybody else can um, is a big struggle in it. Not having the housing is a barrier for him as a parent. You know, he's got, we've got four children. They're all very young, um, eight, or our oldest is eight, our youngest is one, and our other two are four and five. Um, so just being able to play a role as a father with a disability is hard enough nonetheless to not have housing. He can't tuck them into bed at night. Um, he can't give them baths. It's hard for him to cook meals for them because it's not accessible for him. Um, being able to play out in the yard, if he can't get outside properly, you know, he can't do all of those things. So um, it would be really nice to see a lot less discrimination in the housing market. Um, and the ability for them to get away with it and get around it would be nice. And to be able to see that the state funded programs are a little bit more lenient, especially for disabled, because just because, you know, one person applies, I know they want to be fair and they should be fair, but I feel like they should have a little more exception for the disabled, because if you don't get state housing, you don't have handicap housing. 95% of houses and apartments around where I am Almost all of them are not set up for somebody in a wheelchair or somebody that's disabled. So um, that would be what I would like to see. Uh, I don't really know what else to say because I didn't really prepare too well for this. I'm a very unorganized person. So, um, but I appreciate you guys listening. Thank you, Brooke. Uh, next, we'll hear from Derek Malbro, uh, who will be talking about his current experiences uh, with being homeless. Hello everyone, um, my name is Derek Malbro. Um, my pronouns are him and his. Um, I just wanted to speak to you guys today um, and maybe give a little encouragement and motivation to keep doing what you're doing. Um, I've been, um, I'm a black male. Um, I have very curly hair and I'm wearing a black sweatshirt. Um, so I'm from New Orleans, Louisiana. Um, I haven't been here in Vermont very long at all. And um, 
when I first came here, I didn't have a friend. I didn't have anyone to turn to. Um, I've been on the streets for pretty much all my life. Um, I'm a, I was a Katrina survivor. Um, I was a foster child and eventually I was orphanized. Um, I was on the streets for a long time in my life, just running away, going from school to school. And never before have I seen a community of people that are as dedicated to your, the cause that is here for the housing. Um, when it comes to disabilities, when it comes to people who are, have psychiatric um, afflictions, um, I just, I have never seen a more solid community of people. Um, I was sitting in Montpelier Transit Center and I didn't have anything to do. Um, I was actually drawing a picture. I'm an artist and I didn't know where I was going to go. So I looked up, I was looking down and I didn't want to talk to anybody. I was kind of afraid and kind of nervous. Like, like I said, I'm from Louisiana. So it's a very different setting for me. Um, now I looked up and there was a poster on the window at Montpelier Transit Center. And it was a poster for another way. And I decided to call that number. I didn't have anything else to do. So I called that number and I discovered another way here in Montpelier. And throughout the course of time, I found a very dedicated community who helped me back on my feet, took me in and supported all my dreams, all my interests. Um, and now I'm teaching art here and will soon be obtaining employment. Um, my ID, they have been helping me get that. Um, I just got my birth certificate, my birth certificate here in the mail today. Um, thanks to Miss Erica and the other lovely people here at Another Way. And um, housing is the next step after all of that. I can say firsthand that I don't think that sometimes these organizations know just how big of an impact that you guys make on our lives. Um, I was almost forced into gang life. Thank God I wasn't. But I, it almost happened. And, but thanks to communities like Another Way, thanks to people like you guys, I didn't have to go that route. I could choose to draw my pictures. I could choose to sing my songs. I could choose to have the right friends because people like you are out there. And that's worth more than gold to me. And I just thank all of you. And um, that, that concludes my, my um, statements. Thank you, Derek. Uh, now we'll hear from Randy Lazat, a peer advocate with Northwest Counseling and Support Services. Hi, my name is Randy Lazat, and I do work as a peer advocate at NCSS. I, I'm a middle-aged male wearing glasses and a gray shirt, and I have a traumatic brain injury, which left me with some physical challenges. And um, so housing has always been an issue for me. I've never, I mean, I've been in state housing and it's like, it, it was income-based or section eight or something. And, but the, the physical piece of it, I've never been able to find anything that, I, I could safely like either climb stairs or get into a bathtub. I mean, I, I've lived in places where the, the setting, the, the way the, the bathroom is set up, I could figure out how to get in and out of the tub, but I shouldn't have to figure out all this stuff. And I even grew up in a house with seven bedrooms, Two, uh, two bathrooms in a living room, and most of the, the bedrooms were upstairs, and only one of those sets of stairs had a handrail on it on one side. So I had to figure out on the, if I was coming down the stairs, I'd have to figure out how I'd get down, or, and, and I'm still faced with that sometimes. So, and even the affordable housing, However, uh, listening to the two 
ladies that were talking about um, their children. I do know of that there was a program that was developed in the Addison County area where there were two individuals who were receiving services who were put in a house that was owned by the agency and they had people coming in and out to help them, but they lived together kind of a, a I guess you'd call it assisted living, but it, it was them helping each other. And I also used to teach a class called the Learning for Living class, which is people with disabilities who want to be as independently, live as, pendant, as dependently as possible. We had everybody from who had either physical disabilities all the way up to just didn't know what they were doing to, um, and we even had some people who after, uh, actually afterward benefited from it because they did find a home provider that really worked for them. So I'm hoping that somehow we can get some of these programs or ideas back to back back working again and unfortunately all these things cost money so thank you thank you randy uh next we'll hear from val hughes uh deaf independence program coordinator at Vermont Center for Independent Living, uh, who has been working with deaf and hard of hearing peers who need accessible alarms and doorbells. Okay, just figuring out, making sure the interpreter is unmuted. So, good afternoon. My name is Val Hughes. I'm a white woman, brown hair, pulled back in a ponytail right now. I'm wearing a reddish orange colored shirt. And I'm in my living room right now. So we have, I'm sitting in a gray couch and I have the wall with a curtain behind me. It's kind of green. So my friend, David, who's supposed to be joining this Zoom as an electrician, is kind of struggling right now getting entrance into the Zoom. So he might talk later. I'm not sure if that will happen or not. But I work with deaf individuals in the state of Vermont. And a lot of them are really frustrated with their housing. For example, um, you know, the fire alarms. You know, making sure that there is one in each room. I know this one deaf individual who struggles with that. We act, we chatted with their landlord and finally we were able to get a uh, fire alarm set up. We need to get one more in the bathroom, you know, cause what if you are in the bathroom, you know, and a fire does occur, you, you need to know what's happening in any part of the home. And also the, the same individual who lives in an apartment building, you know, they have an intercom system, but how can that deaf individual know when someone's trying to buzz the door and, ga and gain access into the, into the building? So we, t again, talked to the landlord trying to do, um, like kind of maybe potentially do a video, um, and he was not agreeable to that. Doing perhaps maybe a wireless doorbell. And then, you know, even with, even with the wireless doorbell, what if that battery dies? How are we going to know if it's still working or not? We, it needs to be wired. So my friend, David, who's an electrician himself is deaf. He was going to come here and kind of explain all of this, <laughs> but again, he's having a struggle. Um, but this is something that's really prevalent in the deaf and hard of hearing community. And an electrician would just kind of put in the, um, you know, a, a doorbell, a flash, uh, flashing light, something like that. You know, they have a program set up for the summer to do that. And 
And I'm trying to work on that to get more accessibility for the deaf and hard of hearing community to get these doorbells, these fire alarms. And the next step is to, to talk with the, um, work with the commissioner on this, working with legal aid. But it definitely is a huge concern for the deaf and hard of hearing population to have access. You know, landlords, you know, that it's their responsibility to have to, to, I know often the landlords end up being replaced. And I think it's important that, you know, whoever the landlord is should be there and fixing the problems and make sure they're accessible. They kind of have this hands-off approach. Oh, it's not my responsibility, but it, it's a real issue. It's a real issue. And I, I'm not sure what's happening with David. He's still not here. Give me just one moment. Let me check in. He said he's still trying to access it. So perhaps he can come back on later. I'm not sure. This is Nick. But I'll just let the next person go and then maybe we can come back to him later. This is Nick. That sounds like a good idea. Thank you, Val. Okay. Thank you, Val. Uh, thank you to all the individuals and groups we just heard from. I found their stories to be very enlightening and relatable. I hope everyone in attendance tonight We'll be able to take something from these stories with them. We will now hear from a number of individuals who work in housing advocacy, state government, community development, and more. First, we'll hear from Representative Tom Stevens, Vice Chair of the House Committee on General Housing and Military Affairs. Um, thank you, everybody. This has been um, really humbling to listen to the needs of your community and to know that there is such a big um, a big lack and a big canyon between the work that we're doing in the housing committee and what's happening out in your world um, this is in our world because it is it's it's our community and I, you know the things that we've been working on in the housing committee general housing and military affairs uh, have to do quite a bit recently with post-pandemic or pre or during the pandemic. There's been a lot of money that's come in to help with homelessness. Um, there's been a lot of money to try to build new units. And there's now money available to build um, housing for people who are, um, for, for single family homes, for people who might be making 100% of area median income. And not we're not talking specifically about rental housing. And very little of the legislation that I've that's come across our committee has has had accessibility um, has dealt with any of these issues and it's really humbling to hear that to, to, to admit that because I'd like to be able to say there's a big pipeline of stuff coming through but from from our perspective right now there isn't and this is a real wake-up call for us to make sure that um, not only that the units are available there is a housing crisis there are there are very few rental units, period, that are affordable left in Vermont right now on, an, on a regular basis. And it's too easy to couple that with the lack of capacity, with the lack of people who are available to, um, to be live-in companions in, in the state, the, whether that's a salary issue or just a numbers person, a, a numbers issue. Um, that in itself is holding us back. But... Um, I know that we're hearing we're hearing testimony over the last week or so about no cause evictions, and and we know that Burlington at least has a bill that passed through the House and Senate that that may or may not get vetoed by the governor, and we have we have some um, language that may be put into one of the housing bills that's about a temporary ban on no cause evictions because we have heard um, direct testimony from folks in in Chittenden County, especially where their disability did not prevent them from being evicted because of the no cause evictions. So it is with um, really a, a, a really hard heart to hear um, or to say, to be, have to say out loud that we have a lot of work to do. And I think the folks that I've seen on this committee, on, on, on this hearing, I've seen Representative Wood and Representative Brumstead who are on the Human Services Committee who um, 
who who may have more and in, in different information than I have. Um, but I can assure you that we will keep a focus on the needs and make sure that the things that we are doing, which are about rental housing safety, um, which are about enforcement of, of rental housing safety. And, and I think that includes um, some of the issues we just heard about, whether the apartments have enough fire, um, you know, carbon monoxide uh, alarms or fire alarms within them as a normal course of business for people, especially for landlords who rent to people who are hard of hearing. And so um, I'm gonna just leave it at that right now and thank you all for your stories. They are very, very difficult um, to hear and they're really putting us on the spot in terms of what needs to be done for, for our communities that need this. Um, when it comes to the development um, of, of these funds, again, we've assigned some housing to be built with some of this money, uh, the ARPA money that came in, the CRF money that came in before that, um, the, I'm sorry, the CARES relief funds that came in before that, the ARPA money, I don't know what it stands for, but it, it's government money that came in to help us get through the pandemic, a lot of which has been assigned to different levels of, of housing development over, over time. And um, I will leave it to, um, the Commissioner of Housing is going to speak soon to also discuss, like, how do we make sure that this is a priority for us moving forward, not only in legislation, which is our responsibility, but also in the way the policy might get set at the administrative level. So um, thank you for the opportunity to come here and be really humbled by, by the work that we need to do um, and the work that we need to do in front of us. Thank you. Thank you, Represent Representative Stevens. And next, uh, we'll actually hear from Josh Hanford, uh, Commissioner of the Department of Housing and Community Development. Good afternoon. My name is Josh Hanford. Uh, my pronouns are he and him. I I'm a white man with short brown hair and a small short beard at this point as well and wearing a blue and white striped dress shirt. Um, thank you for, for having me. I too um, have been listening, trying to learn and, and hear about the stories and, and thinking about how um, those can be put in action. Um, you know, I'm, I'm here before you too to say that I have a lot to learn about how to serve Vermonters with disabilities. Um, for, for years, I've worked with uh, VCIL um, on some access accessible um, projects in many community buildings across the state, you know, think libraries, town halls, community centers, we've had a, a good partnership to ensure that we've provided uh, specific funding to make them fully accessible, um, not just a bathroom or a ramp, but do an, an assessment all the way from parking spots to rows and, and every aspect. And, um, it's something that's sorely missing in many of our public places in Vermont. Um, and because of the age and the year they were built, um, you can only imagine that you do, you know, the housing situation is even worse. We have some of the oldest housing stock in the country. Um, and we have a lot of programs to address housing and build new housing. But a lot of the housing that we, um, uh, support or, or or is available is privately owned. And uh, about 75% of the rental stock is owned by private landlords. Much of it in these older, large single family homes that were built in another century and they were broken up into small apartments without much thought given for accessibility and requirements. They were simply broken apart into apartments. And that's what a lot of folks have to depend on to serve their housing needs. Um, it's true, we have a very uh, great network of, of nonprofit, public housing, affordable housing providers um, to provide housing for folks, but that's not enough. When you look at that 75% of our rental property is owned by private landlords. Um, I feel we've started to uh, ad address the long backlog of, um, sort of deferred maintenance and habitability issues in these apartments. 
Um, it's been a long time coming and a lot more needs to be done. Um, I know I've had conversations with Commissioner Hunt and her team about how to incentivize um, any assistance we provide to landlords to, to address these uh, apartments and make them require them to be affordable rents to um, also incentivize accessibility um, work in those, in those units. Um, we know that we, we, we should also add um, specific incentives and resources to ensure that happens. Uh, because it, in cases where someone's only doing one apartment, I know a lot of the accessibility requirements don't, don't comply if there isn't a number of units that are, are being worked on to hit the threshold of minimum accessibility work that's done when you do, you know, a, a 10 unit building or, or something along those lines. When you're doing one apartment with one owner in one town, um, we should be incentivizing them to do this. And they're gonna need some extra support to do that. Um, they shouldn't be passing that on in higher rents, but yet those costs are gonna be bore by them. Um, and if they don't have support to help them do that work, uh, the rents will be too high. And so we have to partner um, with lots of people out there, private owners, um, charitable organizations, state and local government to sort of address this housing need across the state. You know, you, you can't go anywhere and we can't think about uh, any solutions uh, without mix, putting housing right in the forefront um, and in the mix. And I know that I'm encouraged by this conversation. Um, the folks that spoke about um, what, what the good things that are happening, let, let's continue those and let's really zero in on the, the things that aren't working. Um, and you know, happy to have continued conversations um, with partners from across the state and our uh, nonprofit uh, housing uh, providers and builders, as well as these new initiatives to get more people to be part of the solution. We, we have to get more people that own housing, that want to build housing, that want to refurbish housing to understand this need and, and um, bring them into the fold to get them to do the good work that's necessary um, because it does take resources and it does take will to get this done. Um, and I, I think, you know, your, your folks out there telling the story, um, working with the legislature to, to push the needs forward is, is how that gets done. Um, so I'm going to be around for questions. Um, you know, I, I just wanted to really mainly listen and hear how we can help and, and, and partner and make connections to, uh, put, put the ask that you're bringing forward in, into action really. And so with that, uh, thank you again for inviting me and, um, hope that we can continue to partner, um, in this work. Thank you. Thank you, Commissioner Hanford. Next, we'll hear from Monica White, uh, the Commissioner of Department of Disabilities, Aging and Independent Living. Hi, thank you. Um, as noted, um, Monica White, Commissioner of Dale, um, which is the Department of Disabilities, Aging and Independent Living. I am um, a woman, a white woman. Um, I have, depending on the day, either dark brown or light brown hair. Um, and I'm presently wearing a green-ish dress with a uh, tan-ish scarf. And um, apparently I like using um, the descriptor-ish. Uh, so um, first, thank you so much to the Vermont Coalition for Disability Rights for convening this really, really important topic. Um, it's something that um, it's really fabulous to have by last count, I think 75 people in this virtual room here um, to, uh, to have a, a frank discussion about where some of the gaps are pertaining to, to housing for um, folks um, who are uh, folks in the disability community. Um, so a, a few things, um, just uh, looking to, um, I'm here to listen. So uh, having heard the, the really powerful stories, some of them I, are, were gaps that I was aware of and others were completely new to me. I've been in this role for about a year and I think um, I will uh, echo uh, comments that I heard from Commissioner Hanford and also Representative Stevens that 
I'm, a, I'm feeling a little humbled, like, wow, you know, I, I very much do not have all of the answers. Um, and uh, it's learning tonight, like, wow, there's, there's gaps that I wasn't even aware of. So I am extraordinarily grateful to be sitting here and um, for folks who have shared their stories, very, very powerful. Um, I think in terms of um, in terms of housing, where we all want to move forward is to have options to assure that all Vermonters have appropriate housing options and if needed, appropriate services and supports. So Vermonters with developmental disabilities, physical disabilities, older Vermonters, um, those are, are the goals that we want to strive for um, in this particular topic. Um, I noted, uh, I think I saw a few legislators on the call, um, and I will do a shout out to um, some of our legislators who have been extraordinary advocates for um, persons with developmental disabilities in terms of H720, which is um, a bill um, which includes provisions for um, my department, Dale, um, to move forward with some residential housing options, which um, we are intending to do with or without the bill, but with the bill behind us, it'll really strengthen us and our, our work forward on that. Um, I think that's a voice that are many voices that I've heard in the past year um, that we do need additional options um, for persons with developmental disabilities in, insofar as um, residential um, options go. So um, that ball will be moving down the field um, very uh, shortly um, over the coming few years. And, um, you know, one of the things that um, really strikes me sitting here again it's it's 5 45 on a on a Monday night that we have this many people um, engaged in, in here um, for this particular discussion is the power that we have in this state that we have that are we're small but mighty we have a few legislators here we've got folks um, within the administration we've got folks um, in the disability community all here listening to um, listening to what some of the problems are. So I'm, I'm confident that we can come together to the table for what, what are the solutions to address the issues that have been identified here tonight and some that probably haven't been um, mentioned specifically. Um, really the, the strength um, that we have as, as our small size to be able to um, make everyone aware of what the issues are um, as it pertains to um, housing, universal design, um, additional options uh, for um, persons with developmental disabilities, et cetera, et cetera. Um, so I, I don't want to sit here and talk because I'm really, like I said, here to listen. So um, thank you very much for the opportunity to, um, to be here tonight. And I'm looking forward to um, hearing what everyone else has to say. Thank you, Commissioner White. Uh, next, we'll hear from Rachel Selig, uh, Director of the Disability Law Project. Good evening, everyone. Uh, as Adam said, my name is Rachel Selig, and I am Director of the Disability Law Project at Vermont Legal Aid. I'm also a person with a disability myself. My pronouns are she, her. My visual description is that I'm a white woman with long, curly brown hair that's quite frizzy this afternoon. I'm wearing glasses with purple rims and a dark purple shirt. The Disability Law Project is part of Vermont's federally funded protection and advocacy system, also known as the National Disability Rights Network, along with Disability Rights Vermont. And I believe there are some folks from DRVT, Disability Rights Vermont, and Vermont Legal Aid on tonight as well. We represent and provide legal advice and self-advocacy support to Vermonters with disabilities who have legal issues arising out of their disabilities. When it comes to housing, our project focuses on working with clients to advocate for reasonable accommodations and modifications. For example, last year I worked with an individual who needed an automated door, but was denied the accommodation because it was viewed by their subsidized housing provider as an undue financial burden, even though the cost of the door was less than a tenth of a percent of the entity's reported assets. It shouldn't take a lawyer to request a reasonable accommodation like this, and yet in his case and in many others, it does. Once we got involved, the door was approved, but then it took months to order the door and arrange for the installation, which meant that for all of that time, the individual did not have equal access and use and enjoyment of his unit. 
We also work with individuals to access housing supports through Medicaid funded programs, uh, like the ones Monica just described. But part of making sure that those serve those housing supports are accessible and useful for folks is to make sure that we adequately fund these systems. Right now, we have a huge workforce crisis, um, and we are not able to pay people enough to allow them to stay in the field, to attract people that really want to provide the supportive services. I think that connects to what we heard from Sandy and from Deborah at the beginning about you know, people doing the job because they felt like they had to. And we also need to be able to pay people enough that they can afford housing themselves while they live in Vermont and provide supports uh, to allow us to have the housing that we want and need in our communities. Uh, right now, too many Vermonters who are eligible for home and community-based supports are not receiving some or all of the services they've been determined to be necessary to receive because too little has been done to invest in the workforce and address this workforce crisis. But these supports, these accommodations, these modifications are necessary to not only ensure an equal opportunity to use and enjoy our housing, but also to remain in the community in our least restrictive environment. In addition to the work that my project does at Legal Aid, Vermont Legal Aid uh, and our sister organization, Legal Services Vermont, are constantly involved in representing people in housing matters, very often people with disabilities. This work includes not only eviction defense, but also affirmative fair housing litigation, housing discrimination testing, and including complaint-based testing and assessment of ADA compliance and new construction. Right now, we also have projects that are specifically targeted to connecting Vermont renters and homeowners with funds made available through federal COVID legislation to help get caught up with rent, with mortgages, and other housing-related costs like utilities. Uh, I heard Representative Stevens comment earlier that he felt that maybe there was a gap between what the legislature has been working on and, and what we all need uh, to have accessible and universally accessible housing in our state. Um, he mentioned that there is a bill right now to consider a no-cause moratorium. I think that would actually make a big difference for our community. Right now, about 50% of cases filed for eviction in Vermont are filed as no-cause. And just a couple of years ago in 2019, Vermont Legal Aid did a report. That number was only 18%. And a lot of the people who are in these no-cause cases, like Brooke, who spoke earlier, are people or family members of people with disabilities. That would go a long way in ensuring that we have access to safe and stable housing. His committee has also worked on the very large omnibus housing bill, also known as S226. And this creates incredible investments in housing across the state, both for home ownership and for rentals. Uh, provided that those units that are developed or rehabilitated are accessible or universally designed, this creates a huge opportunity for people with disabilities across our state as well. Um, Monica mentioned H720, which would, among other things, create a residential um, services uh, coordinator at, the, at Dale, at the De Department for Disabilities, Aging and Independent Living, and create pilot programs to explore other residential options. Um, I think it's important for us to explore the different ways that we can all live safely within our communities. And H329 is a bill that's worth noting, which would change the standard necessary to prove harassment as a form of discrimination, to lower it from the current very high standard of severe or pervasive uh, to a standard where you can show that you've experienced discrimination through harassment, where the conduct against you, the unwanted conduct, is more than what someone else with your protected characteristic would view as being a petty, slight, or trivial inconvenience. All of these things, I think, would make housing more accessible, more universally designed uh, for our community. So um, I will pause there and happy to stay on for the question and answer portion. Thanks, everyone. Thank you, Rachel. Uh, next, we'll hear from David Martins. Executive Director of the Vermont Affordable Housing Coalition. Thanks, Adam. I'm going to uh, get David in just a moment. If I could just remind everybody, we know there's a lot of important issues that everybody wants to express. It's very difficult sometimes for people to see a lot of chat popping up. 
Um, some people have, you know, myself included, difficulties seeing different words popping up at different times. Um, screen readers also will sometimes read them for people who are visually impaired. So if you please could hold your comments, they're all very important, we want to share them. Thank you so much. Next, we will have David as soon as I get him. David, why don't you go ahead? Thanks very much. Uh, my name is David Martins uh, and uh, my pronouns are he, him. I'm a white man uh, with no hair at all. Hearing everyone describe their hair made me a little jealous. Uh, no, no hair at all and wearing a blue polo shirt. And I'm the director at the Vermont Affordable Housing Coalition. Um, I'm also uh, a, a flatlander uh, is the term that I've learned that uh, I'm not actually from Vermont. I'm new to Vermont. I'm new to, uh, to this role. And as someone who's new to Vermont, I find that uh, it, it puts me in a bit of a unique spot because uh, I think that I'm able to look at our housing crisis here uh, as well as the many attempts to uh, to face it, to conquer it uh, from a unique perspective. And our challenges as a state in the housing world are certainly unique as they are in, in every state. Uh, but what's also wonderfully unique is the dedication of all the people who work so hard uh, in this work every day from the legislators, uh, the governor and the folks in his, uh, in his administration and the, and the folks, the, 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 the housing providers and developers. Uh, and along that theme of uniqueness, uh, the Affordable Housing Coalition has a unique role. We're not one of those folks who are out there developing housing. We do education, advocacy and outreach around the issue of affordable housing. So this time of year, I spend a lot of time sitting uh, sitting along the wall in Representative Stevens' committee room, listening to uh, to hearings about housing bills. Uh, but advocacy is about more than a presence in the state house, and that's what I'd like to use my couple minutes to comment on today. That an important part of advocacy is education and outreach, and so something that VAHC, which is the acronym for uh, for our organization. Um, something that we are focusing on uh, is trying to bring everyone's voice to the table. Uh, you know, the, the um, Josh Hanford, uh, Commissioner Hanford and Representative Stevens commented on, uh, on this gap between uh, kind of what's happening in the legislature and the challenges that are faced by different Vermonters and maybe by helping bring everyone's voice to the table that chasm can close a bit and so a big part of what we do we started uh, before the legislative session this year and we'll continue focusing on it when the session is over because the session occupies a lot of our time and attention uh, will really be to bring together folks so that we can get all kinds of input on uh, from different people's perspectives about housing the uh, one piece that we are uh, that we also do or that we're, we're doing currently is putting together our diversity equity and inclusion subcommittee and their role is going to be not only to look at how we are mindful of these matters within our organization but how do we look at uh, all housing issues through that lens all the time so that when we're in these hearings and when we're in these, uh, when we're looking at a piece of legislation or when we're talking to folks or when we're uh, bringing people together to talk about housing and potential solutions, are we bearing all of these things in mind? Do we bear in mind this idea of like universal accessibility? Do we bear in mind uh, the population whose voices all too often go unheard? So you can expect that you continue to, uh, to see my face and see the name of our organization as we try to really make sure that all Vermonters get heard because the I say all the time that our housing crisis is complicated and uh, I was a philosophy major in college and one principle that we learned was that most things in life are not a matter of either or they're a matter of both and so there's not one solution there's not one magic bill there's not one model that's going to work. We need 
to look at things and come at these challenges from multiple perspectives. And in order to do that, we need every voice that we can get. So thank you so much for thank you so much for having me today. And thank you to all of you who do such incredible work who have uh, who have spoken today. It's certainly been a learning experience for me. And we look forward to continuing to work with everybody. Thank you, David. Uh, next, we'll hear from Megan Rausch at the Community Development. Oh, she's a Community Development Underwriter for the Vermont Housing Finance Agency. Hello, um, my name is Megan Rausch, and my pronouns are she, her. I'm a white woman with uh, medium length dark blonde hair, and I'm wearing a uh, black turtleneck shirt. And I'm a Community Development Underwriter with Vermont Housing Finance Agency or VHFA. Um, and it's really been great to be here listening, learning, and speaking with you all today. So thank you so much for having me. At VHFA, uh, we finance and promote affordable, safe, and decent housing opportunities for low to moderate income Vermonters. VHFA supports people in purchasing homes. We also help with the development and management of affordable housing apartments statewide by providing um, financing and management support and subsidy administration and also tax credits. Um, we have heard so many stories tonight um, about not being able to find housing in the areas that people want to live and with the need um, and to meet the needs of the individuals and it's truly heartbreaking. Um, many of Vermont, uh, Vermont's communities and housing developments tend to be small, and in many communities there are few rental opportunities and even fewer accessible options within those rental opportunities. VHFA strives to make all of our funding, uh, funded projects accessible to current and future occupants, and we want our residents to be able to age, maintain, and be in place in any um, through any temporary or permanent disability. And we want them to be able to be active members of the community and have anyone be able to visit them, anyone and everyone be able to visit them. Um, we know and have heard tonight that there are limited housing units in Vermont and ex for accessible, accessible units for people with disabilities and even fewer affordable ones. Additionally, potentially, uh, uh, potentially modifiable units are even um, are dis disproportionately located in only the newer buildings. Information about the accessibility of Vermont's housing stock is also difficult to obtain on the private side. There are um, a number of accessible and adaptable units that are reported by the um, housing managers and displayed for all of the affordable housing in the Vermont um, Directory of Affordable uh, Rental Housing. And that list is um, all of the affordable housing within Vermont um, that VHFA um, manages that website. And this website is out there for Vermonters to have a tool for making more informed decisions about where they would like to live and the options they have within that, that housing. Um, the site contains real, a real-time directory of all of the Vermont um, affordable apartments with their rent, um, the, are available to the public and their project-based uh, subsidies that are available at that location. Um, the list of apartment vacancies is also maintained on that website. And when you're looking for an apartment, you can search within that and it can be tailored to specific needs like accessible units or adaptable units, elevators within the buildings, and many other options that are available like on-site laundry and other wait list if the wait list is open. The Vermont Qualified Allocation Plan, or the QAP, sets forth um, the process and criteria under which um, housing developments are selected to receive um, funding for, with housing credits. And that's one of the biggest sources of funding for rental apartments within the state. Um, with the QAP, there are requirements of accessibility and adaptable housing and all Vermont, uh, VHFA properties and units are required to meet universal design standards um, in addition to the Vermont access rules for being accessible or adaptable and visitable. Universal design is, um, has been talked about a few times over the course of tonight and it's the design that helps to ensure that uh, products and building or uh, pro different buildings are able to be 
um, accessed by virtually everyone, regardless of their level of ability or disability. And we have a public process that happens every two years that makes changes to this QAP. And it's going to be starting this summer um, with an update to go into effect in 2024. Um, and I'm going to take the stories I've learned tonight, the information, and take that into this process moving forward. But we always love to hear public feedback and any suggestions. So I, I welcome any thoughts that anyone has um, on how we can better serve Vermonters. And we know there's a ton of work to be done to ensure that uh, Vermonters with disability have access to safe and accessible homes. And we are ready to listen and trying to help in any way we can. So thank you for having me. Thank you, Megan. Uh, lastly, we will hear uh, from Patricia Tedesco, Program Services Manager at VCIL. Hi, this is Patricia Tedesco. Um, I go by the pronouns she, her. My description is I am a white woman. I'm 60 years old. I have long red hair that is still mine and uh, I'm wearing a blue shirt, which matches my blue eyes and I'm wearing a headset. So it looks like I work at the McDonald's drive through window. <laughs> so there you go. I've been uh, at VCIL for 10 years and the home access program is the, the program I've been working with for the past six years. I feel like I have great news for everybody on this call tonight because we have funding through the Vermont Housing and Conservation Board, which helps folks with disabilities who are low income in Vermont get their homes or apartments or wherever they're living become more accessible, either through a bathroom modification or by adding a ramp. We have income eligibility limits. Um, that chart is available on our website. It goes by household, by county. So, um, and let me preface all of my comments by saying, I'm, I'm trying to be very brief here because of time, but if anyone has any questions or specific questions, they can contact myself and also Susan Brito, who works with this same program is on this call and, and she does primarily the intake and um, eligibility. So um, goes by household income, by county, by size of household, and depending on someone's need with a physical, a permanent physical disability, we can do, as I mentioned, a bathroom modification, which generally is a tub to shower conversion, sometimes replacing a vanity sink with a pedals, pedals, pe, pe, pedestal sink. To, I believe it was Sandy talk earlier about a track system. We have installed track systems in homes uh, to make a bathroom more accessible. Um, when I listened to Val speaking about the flashing smoke detectors, we have done um, similar things um, in an apartment building somewhere in the south of the state. We um, also have, usually we have six grants that are $5,000 each, which go to nonprofit housing places to make a nonprofit housing um, unit or building more accessible. So for example, it could be an entrance that everybody uses, or it could be for a specific apartment. Um, this year, we've done some tub to, tub to shower conversions with Cathedral Square. We're doing same thing in um, Barton Apartments. So it's statewide. And um, when someone, we have a waiting list of about 50 people right now, but if somebody has $1,000 in leverage funding towards a ramp or $2,000 in leverage funding towards a bathroom modification, our grant funding can generally cover the balance of that. So uh, the first thing we try to do is find out if the applicant is on Choices for Care, which is a Medicaid waiver program. Um, if they are, then that generally gives them some home um, modification money that we can partner with. We also have worked with Champlain Housing Trust and the other home ownership centers around the state. We work a lot with the USDA. If someone's a veteran, we try to connect them directly with um, the VA for a, a $2,000 grant, which is sometimes available. 
um, Susan's really good about reviewing the application and seeing where we can fit partner funding in. We work with several of the um, Habitat for Humanity groups around the state and also Cover Home Repair in White River Junction. And when we accept someone's application for a ramp um, installation and and they can also be found eligible through one of the habitats or cover home repair, that person doesn't have to come up with the thousand dollars because the value of the volunteer labor from that group uh, counts. So that's somebody who can generally move right off the waiting list. And I apologize to the interpreters for talking so fast. And <laughs> I am aware that I am the last speaker before questions, which is better than being the last speaker before lunch. So I'm going to end there. And um, as I said, if anyone has specific questions, feel free to email Susan and I after the fact um, another time. Thank you. And I'm going to mute myself now. Thank you, Patricia. Uh, I would like to thank everyone who spoke tonight. That was a great discussion on housing issues facing the Vermont disability community. I know I learned a lot tonight, and I hope everyone in the audience did as well. Uh, we're now going to open the floor uh, for questions and comments. Um, please post your any questions or comments in the chat or raise your hand on Zoom. Um, and we just ask, ask that you try to keep your questions brief um, as we are starting to run out of time. Uh, Jules. Can you hear me OK? Yes. I have a neighbor who's disabled. He's on SSDI. His rent went up during COVID and his rent is now more than his SSDI and he's spending all of his savings trying to pay his rent and racking up a lot of debt. And the problem is that Section 8 hasn't been open for a long time and he just needs a rental voucher. And with Section 8 never opening, it looks like he's just going to end up being homeless. Is there ever going to be a solution for people like him that are currently homed in a place they want to stay and their rent just went up? They just need a voucher. Okay. Um, may I answer that? Sure. Uh, I would suggest, first, first of all, I want to apologize for not identifying myself visually. I am um, a 60-year-old white male with gray hair, and I'm wearing a bunch of um, a headset, and I've gone on a dark blue shirt with flowers on it. Um, I, I would suggest, Jules, that, that this person contact the Vermont State Housing Authority as soon as possible. There is money available that is COVID-based on, on, on first glance, but they have um, vouchers that are... Um, that may be ready to go in this particular situation. I think the, I think they recognize that there are some issues again with raising of the rent, of which there is no cap in Vermont on how much you can raise your rent. There are notification uh, caps, but there are no real percentage caps. Um, but they should call. They should call the Vermont State Housing Authority and ask um, for help through that system. There's money. Oh. available through the what's called the VRAP program, which is the um, Vermont, um, it's the money that we got in December of 2020 that does have some strings on it that are that are COVID based, but they should be able to have um, information for, for that person pretty quickly. Uh, okay, I think that's only if you have not been able to pay your rent and he's just running up credit card debt. So. That that to me is called not being able to pay your rent, <laughs> and so I there is no one should have to be giving up their savings like this to pay for rent. That's far and away, um, they, you know. Again, they they should reach out to to VA such a V um, VSHA and try to find um, uh, the right voucher. All right, thank you. I just add, Jules, that what you've identified is this is not just a Vermont specific problem, that things like being able to have more Section 8 vouchers, it requires change at the federal level as well. Um, so we can talk a lot tonight about Vermont and things we can do here, 
And also some of what we need to do is see change in Washington. All right, thank you. Thank you, everyone. Uh, next we have Mike. Hello, oh boy, I can't get this. Uh, hello, can you hear me? Yes. Uh, I have a pet peeve. I, I don't know how many of the new, uh, how many of the housing uh, situations are brand new, but have any of them, while we're talking about universal housing, been located near universal services, which like uh, such as transportation, which is what would make universal housing really perfect to have it as close to services as possible. And the services in this case being transportation, everybody, not just disabled people, needs uh, perfect transportation. Hey, I, I, could, I, I could take a stab at, at that. This is Josh Hanford. Um, most of the funding for new housing development um, takes that in, into consideration. The uh, applications rate, you know, um, where the transportation is, accessibility to to, to job opportunities. Um, trying to put the housing in the best place, you know, where people need it the most and in the best possible place. That's absolutely a factor um, that, that gets considered. Uh, um, you know, think of the, the transportation uh, center in downtown Montpelier and the housing that went um, up, upstairs from it. That's an example of, of co-locating housing and transportation needs um, very intentionally. And so, we wish there was more opportunities presented um, that could address even more situations, but that is a factor to receive uh, grant funding for housing. I wish so too, Josh, and I live up here in the Northeast Kingdom. Is there some way I can talk to you offline and in person, maybe on phone number or something? If I get my thing in chat, can I can make sure that that gets to you? Sure, absolutely. Yeah, in um, in you know, up in your North Northeast Kingdom area, you know, there's some um, rural edge that works up there, works on this sort of housing. I, I know there's always a need for more, but I know it's an intention that they try to site the housing where there is the best chance for people to get services. Thank you. Thank you. Mike, uh, this is Megan from BHFA. I can also put a link to the uh, housing data website, which you can look in your area by town to see please. if there are affordable housing options. Thank please. you. All right. Looks uh, like Janice has a question. Um, not a question, but more a couple of comments that came up as people were speaking. Um, the flip side of what Mike just said is uh, for people who have chemical sensitivities, um, they're often looking to be a bit away from the hubbub where the air is cleaner. And one thing that could help that is if they um, had more leeway in, in the kinds of housing that they could create for themselves, um, even rurally, like I think there's state level requirements that you have to have a whole septic system put in and things like that, that prevent people from just like having a tiny home with a composting toilet or something like that, which a lot of people in my circles are really wanting to do. Um, so just, um, and uh, the other thing I wanna say, uh, by virtue of my safe housing, I'm able to do some part-time work at a home office and I work for Senior Solutions, which some of you will remember used to be called the Council on Aging for Southeastern Vermont. And because of that, I'm aware that um, the census prediction is by the year 2030, 25% uh, of Vermont's population is predicted to be age 65 and up. So, you know, universal design is the name of the game. I mean, even if you can't have a unit that's totally accessible in every way, we've got to be. I told my parents, you know, okay, you're, you're remodeling this place. Think about, you know, are you going to be able to get into the tub in 10 years? So they made a roll-in shower, you know? 
you can get the the door handles um you know less stairs like there's opportunities all over the place it's just that i think education is required people aren't really thinking about it you know and then one other brief thing that i should have included in my presentation is um since covid uh, many people with long covid are experiencing chemical sensitivities now and so the need for low chemical housing is increasing because of that. Thanks. Thank you. Uh, Jules, I think I'm going to call on Kara next um, since you asked a question before. Uh, go ahead, Kara. Oh. Uh, you're muted. Okay. Can you hear me now? Yes. Okay. Um, I just wanted to comment. Um, I happen to be one of those people who have mast cell activation syndrome and smoking in, um, multi-unit buildings is a huge issue, even if it's banned. Um, before I moved into, um, an apartment building, a certain apartment building that was subsidized, I had never had respiratory issues. Now I have three serious lung diseases, incurable. Um, and I live in a different building now, but it also is smoke free, yet I still have um, both tobacco and marijuana smoke in my apartment on a regular basis. And I doesn't feel like I can do anything about it because you know what I mean, what's better than 100% smoke free, seriously, <laughs> like, you know, um, and there's also issues with um, just finding a wheelchair accessible apartment. I'm a part-time wheelchair user moving steadily towards full-time. And um, I was told that, you know, well, the, the one accessible apartment in this building is taken. Um, and we really don't think that, you know, since this building was just built, we really don't think that they would want to rip out the shower and put in an accessible shower. So if you can't deal with a tub, then this isn't the right place for you. And I was like, this is the only ha housing I can find. So I'm taking it. If I fall, if I, whatever, you know, um, that's great. And they, <laughs> they put in, um, grab bars that I had to buy. Um, and told me that there were no studs to put the grab bars into, so don't hang on to them really. Um, so it, there's a lot of issues, um, and I'm in Winooski, so like this is the most developed area in the, in the state, and if you can't find an accessible apartment here that is also like um, breathable, um, you know, that, that you can breathe without dying basically, um, where else are you going to find it? Um, so I just wanted to comment on that, that smoking rules especially need to be enforced. And if anybody smokes in a building, that means everybody's smoking. Thanks. Thank you, Kara. Uh, so I have a question from Susan. Hi, uh, this is more of a comment than a question. Um, really, I just want to give a huge shout out to our legislators who are here with us this evening, um, starting with the good folks from the House Human Services Committee, um, Vice Chair Teresa Wood, Representative Teresa Wood, and uh, Representative Jessica Bromstead. They were, they were the people behind H720, which Rachel Seelig talked about. And H720 is probably the most important bill for the developmental disability community in decades, probably in the 30 years, it's been 30 years since branding closed. So please, if you haven't already contacted your legislators to support um, H720, please do so. And thank you so much, Representative Wood and Representative Brumstead. And I wanna give a huge shout out also Representative Stevens, who here was speaking about housing, but I want the disability community to know he has been the champion behind the eugenics apology. First, last year was the apology, and this year there's a bill 
that got through the House, but it's in the Senate. Uh, I and about 10 other people will be testifying on it tomorrow. It's H96. It'll create a Truth and Reconciliation Commission to look at the harms done by the state's eugenics policies and practices. And I don't know about you, but I see a direct through line between the policies that created Brandon um, and the state psychiatric hospital and isolated and segregated and de-housed people with disabilities and their families. And I'm stopping my video because everyone froze. I hope you can still hear me. Um, anyway, there's a direct through line between uh, the, pol the eugenics policies and the housing crisis we see. The last issue, and then I, I'll stop talking, that I want to alert everyone to, and I see Julie Tesler here from Vermont Her Partners, is we can have all the housing in the world, but if we don't have a workforce, a well-paid workforce with a livable wage, it's not going to matter. And this is a crisis like we've never seen. And the governor's budget had a 3% increase. The House passed a 7% increase. We're going to have to fight for that <laughs> really hard in the Senate um, to keep it. And there's another bill, also the work of Representative Wood, that's parked in Senate Health and Welfare. No, I think they might have voted it out. H-153. It would not guarantee rate increases for our workforce, but it would start the process of having a fair rate review. Every other workforce, their rates go up when the cost of providing services go up. There's a process for nursing home rate reviews, but if the cost of services go up, their rates go up. The Medicaid providers in other parts of our Medicaid program got a 17% increase for the same services that we're asking our designated agencies to provide year after year, and they do with a no refuse policy with no increase. So yeah, H-153 um, passed the House last year. It's in the Senate. Please reach out and uh, support that and I'll be done now. Oh, I didn't do any of the stuff I was supposed to do at the beginning. I'm terribly sorry. I'm Susan Ernoff. I do policy work for the Developmental Disabilities Council. I use she, her pronouns. I have brown hair and I'm sitting luckily in a sun-drenched porch. So I don't know, maybe you can see I have a black and gray shirt on. Thank you. And thanks for everyone who hung in here tonight and shared your stories and showed up. Thank you, Susan. Uh, looks like Sandy uh, will have her last question of the night. Oh, you're muted. Uh, we can't hear you, Sandy. Is it that the last question of the night? Mm -hmm. Oh, you're muted again. How perfect is it that there was a Zoom like mess up on the very last question of the night? And in my apologies, Adam, you've done a really wonderful, wonderful job. And I just wanted to share with the legislators who kind of were like, this is kind of new and interesting and we haven't heard some of this stuff. I get it. Like our world is a really quiet world. We do like our work with our, with our advocates and our, our agencies and our friends and we do the best we can. But I wanted to give you an analogy that I thought might help because I just helped get my mother-in-law into a, you know, a home and she's aging, she's 89. And there were a lot of choices, lots of choices. Like she could go to a small group home with like, a few people that shared her interest. She could go to a larger home where they had lots of services and like communal dining and music. And 
she could go to a home that really focused on her interests if she was interested in art. We don't have that in Vermont. What we have is one model. It's a shared living provider model where you can have two friends living with you and not with you, not with your parent, not with your aging parent. You have to move out. Um, and you have to live with these people. And when these people get tired of you, they say, bye, our lives have changed. You don't have a forever home. So all I'm here for is that I want a forever home, just like my 89 year old mother-in-law has. She's going to be there maybe until she's 98. Oh God, don't make me do the, all those Thanksgiving dinners for the rest of my life. But if I do, it's okay, because she has a home and she'll be okay. She, caregivers can come and go. And I agree, we have a caregiver crisis in this state. We should be paying them twice as much as we pay them. We have like 800 openings at Howard right now. I'm getting half of the services that my daughter deserves. I'm okay with that, I get it. But what I want is a forever home. I want my choices to be the same kind of choices we made for my mother-in-law. Thank you, Sandy. Uh, I'm going to close real quick. Um, thank you everyone for a great Q&A session. And thank you again to our great speakers. Uh, we couldn't have done this without you. Uh, there's one more Disability Awareness Day, uh, or at least another Disability Awareness Day event coming up on May 10th at 3 p.m. Uh, uh, keynote speaker is Ming Canada from Trace Traipsing Global on Wheels. And finally, thank you all for coming tonight. Special thanks again to the Vermont Dis Developmental Disabilities Council for their funding and support for tonight's event. We hope to see you all next time. If you have any more questions or comments, please feel free to email VCDR. Um, and uh, I'll put that link in the chat.